this is this is a topic you know BJ presented. So I'm going to let him kind of start us off and, and guide things, and we'll go from there. Excellent. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for attending. Um, the topic is uh, it's a little loose, but I think I think it is relevant um, to uh, all of us. Um, this past October, Marwan set up an opportunity for me and for um, uh, uh, Eric um, Hodgson to travel along with John Kessel when John went to teach the FIVB course in uh, Morocco. Um, this is where Mar Marwan's from and Marwan being uh, uh, among the, the top uh, teachers uh, in our sport, the top uh, coaching teachers in our sport wanted um, John to have a little support maybe during FIVB and also for Eric and I to go around the country a little bit and meet some of the people that um, uh, that are influential in the volleyball world to help uh, I, I don't know if it was so much build a culture but to to influence their culture a little bit and to to bring the idea of um, learning through play to uh, to Morocco, um, and uh, I, I think um, I think what what intrigued me about the, having this conversation is one is to to get Marwan to talk about that uh, aspect a little bit, um, having been in Morocco, in the U.S., and around the world as a as a coach and teacher. Um, and two, we can relate it to ourselves in that uh, Morocco as a country has been influenced by a lot of different places in volleyball. And many of the people that we heard as we went around the country, all over the country, were talking about we would like to do things the French way or the Italian way or the U.S. way. And as coaches, we were guilty of the same thing. Uh, me working with my local college team, we may um, we look at Penn State and we want to do we want to do what Wisconsin's doing or Nebraska, or, and sometimes it's wholly inappropriate. Um, so 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 that's that's kind of my bend on this conversation. I um, I hope we can go through uh, an hour of getting some of those aspects from Marwan and and hearing his uh, his experiences. Sounds good. All right. Where would you like to start? Where would I like to start? I would like to start with thanking BJ for taking the trip to Morocco. It wasn't easy for someone from Wisconsin to go to a North African country. He's never, he's never been to Africa before. Um, and um, I, John and Eric, very, very good friends, very intelligent people that I respect a lot. Um, BJ, they... Uh, they went, they worked hard, they got to know a lot of people. And um, the, the most important thing for me, for them to go, is to um, talk about science. Which is what John does all the time. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. It, it was for us, that for the two of us that went, for Eric and for me, it was an embarrassment of riches in getting to sit and listen to John speak for five days and, uh, and to, to help um, with, the, with the class. Um, it, it's, the, the culture in Morocco is, the, is really striking. Um, we, we tend to think of Africa in, in really strange ways in the United States. If you haven't been to Africa, Africa is so large, immense, um, hundreds and thousands of various cultures. This isn't South African Africa. It's not Ethiopia Africa. I, I like in Morocco much more to European style of living. Would you, do you agree with that, Marwan? Absolutely. You know, we're, we're about 10 miles away from Spain. <laughs> uh, two hour flight to Paris and two and a half to London 
to uh, to probably three hours to uh, Rome. I mean, that that culture there is you know rich, the Mediterranean culture, and also um, um, there's a lot of sharing. And um, you know, when you are in Morocco, you 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 have a feel of the Arab culture, the European culture, the African culture, and um, it's a very rich culture, and I like it a lot. Yeah, the, the first thing that... Can you, that, uh, Marwa, can we, you give us kind of a sense of the history of Moroccan volleyball? Moroccan volleyball? Yeah. Okay. So, um, we have... Um, Moroccan volleyball has... I, I don't know the date of existence of the federation. Like, I don't know when was the federation, you know, was first formed. But... Um, but Moroccan volleyball is maybe one of the oldest in Africa. Um, historically, we've been top three in, in Africa behind Egypt and Tunisia. Um, unfortunately, in Africa, we, they only allow one team to participate in the Olympic Games. So um, you have to fight for one spot. It's very... Uh, very hard to make it to the Olympic Games. So we've never, ever, ever participated in any Olympic Games before. Um, Tunisia and Egypt, very strong teams, and um, the culture of volleyball there is much better. Um, the, Af we, we put, in Africa, we participate in every two years in the African Nations Cup. So historically, we took a lot of third places um, our junior national team won the African Nations Cup once, I think. And um, we had many participations in world championships in junior and under-17 national teams. So when we're younger, we're competitive. But as soon as we get to the senior national team, we start to, you know, uh, take a spot in the third, fourth spot. So, like, the top four teams in, the U in Africa are... Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, and Cameroon, and sometimes Algeria. But historically, so, you know, um, we are 40 million people in Morocco, so uh, number one sport is uh, soccer, um, then basketball, then handball. Um, so, so we really um, suffer in taking the best athletes in our sport. Um, and... Um, one of the struggles that we've had historically is um, finding ways to um, recruit the best athletes and, and use science to teach those athletes. Um, and uh, that's why we, we, for the past 30 years, we've always been third or fourth because we just kept doing the same thing. Sure. BJ, did you have a question or was your question the same as mine? I, it was very similar. Um, just to just to get Marwan to kind of give the history a little bit, um, and and it, you can. It, it was amazing to to go there and to talk to people about what they felt volleyball training should be, and there were some there were some very strong opinions from many people. Um, you can. You can feel a change beginning, and I, I likened it to maybe the very early 1980s in the United States, where we we were kind of we're, we're kind of starting to catch on a little bit, but we weren't quite there. And it, it just it feels like the the younger players coming in, the younger coaches coming in, are really getting an idea, and it's it's going to take a, a strong crop of athletes to. To get them over that hump, but boy, the old school style of uh, coach coach on a box hitting balls or tossing balls is uh, is pretty prevalent, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see the players really love to hey let's let's get the ball flying, playing doubles and triples, and learning you know learning that that style. Um, so they're I they're in a divide right now that way. As, as you know, John, in, in Europe, probably same in Morocco, um, everything is free when it comes to club. You know, you don't pay for club when you go to Mor in Morocco. So 
how do clubs recruit players? They recruit them from schools, high schools, middle schools, primary schools. And phys ed teachers have a lot of power. Uh, so they can make you either like the sport or they can make you really hate the sport. So, and they kind of guide you to um, what sport you should try to, you know, you know, try out and see if you like it. Um, so a lot of phys ed teachers, when they go to, to become a phys ed teacher, they specialize. So like they either choose basket, basketball as a specialization or they choose soccer as a specialization or they choose, you know, um, I don't know, handball as a specialization. Each, each, each teacher, they have to uh, kind of, based on my knowledge, uh, choose a sport to specialize at. When they're in school, they teach everything, but they also, but they, um, they stick with the sport that they kind of specialize mm -hmm. in. What happens sure. is that they, um, every sport in, at school, they go and play. So if, if there is like a, a soccer session at school, they just give them the ball and go play. If it's basketball, they give them the ball and they go play. If it's handball, they give them the ball and they go play. Right. When it comes to volleyball, no, 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 no. You have to have the technique. Um, <laughs> let's go to the wall and pass the ball to the wall. We cannot use the net until you master the forearm pass. Oh no, you didn't get it over the net. No, you can't play. You got to go serve to a wall or something like that. So while other sports in Morocco are uh, kind of attracting other kids, phys ed teachers in certain situations, they're driving kids away from volleyball. Because at the point when you tell them to go to the wall, because technically they cannot do anything, they're like, why am I playing this sport? This is too hard. So like they kind of pick and choose and they eliminate probably 95% or maybe 98% of the potential players that might be in love with volleyball and drive them away from the sport. And then we add like maybe one or 2% will be like, oh, let me go to a club and try it out. Right. And then the percentage is so small, 0, 0.0 something of players will end up playing in the club. So by the time you go to the national team, you really don't have a lot of good athletes to choose from. Sure. Uh, it, here in the U.S., coaching was heavily influenced by uh, Japanese and Korean coaches in the 60s and 70s. Is there a sense of that sort of thing in Morocco with say maybe Italian coaches or Russian coaches or name a nationality that kind of has influenced the way coaches approach their job? Yes. Um, as you know, our second language in Morocco is French. So we were colonized by France in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. We got our independence in 1956. So our education system is all based on French education, education system. Even sports, I'm going to give you a fact, right? So number one sport in Morocco is soccer. Lots of participants, pro teams, people making hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. Now, since 1974, we have never won another African Nations Cup. I think the last one was in the 70s. Since 1994, our last participation in soccer, in a, uh, uh, not the last, but we, we participated in the USA World Cup in 1994. Yeah. So since 1994 to 2020, we've had probably eight French coaches. Zero African Nations Cup. And then we had one participation in World Cup in 1998 in France. And then 2000 and uh, the last one in Russia. 
Okay. So we've been heavily dependent on how the French do things. And it has been, in my opinion, a failure for all this time. Is the French system bad? No, it's not. Is the French education bad? No, absolutely not. Is it efficient? Absolutely not. <laughs> so, so to me, um, you cannot back up a system that you have in place with no results. And I'm just talking about soccer. Uh, volleyball, it's kind of the same thing. It's a very, it's based on theory more than practice. So everything is, um, we, we got to do this, we got to do this, we got to, you got to go by like, you know, like everything is outlined, bulletin points, um, and you cannot, and it, everything is broken down. <clears throat> so like if you teach a skill in the way I learned volleyball, they will probably take apart that skill to like 20 things. And then you, the player, have to put that back together in one skill. Sure. You, you know what I mean? So by the time you are, um, you are uh, ready to execute, you, you, you know, you have so much information to process it so hard. You know? Um, uh, and then you have to stick with the sport and then you have to really like it and all that kind of stuff. I was lucky. I played in one of the best clubs in Morocco and I had really good coaches. And one of the luckiest things I had is that I had coaches that were players that played professionally and then uh, became coaches. And we played a lot in my club. So like we would show up a half hour before and we would play doubles until the show, the coach shows up and then we will play for two hours. And, um, uh, the, the French system is definitely a system based on technique first and then let's play. And, and I think that's what drives away people from the sport. I think you're getting a little bit of grief in the chat. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I'm guessing things, uh, what you guys saw when you were over there with John probably wasn't a lot different than what you experienced when you were coming up as a player then. Are, are you asking me? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously BJ wasn't there as a player, so he's not going to give us much background on that. But just, a, just wondering if anything has, has changed since your days developing as a player. Um. Honestly, the truth, not so much. Um, so when I, I got the chance to go back and coach in 2015, the Moroccan national team, um, I was the assistant coach, and, um, and I saw so many things that I would never do over here. Like coaches coaching in certain ways. Um, mm. Do they... Are they doing it on purpose? Are they like, like really looking forward to failing their players? No, it's just an efficient ways of doing of teaching of teaching volleyball players. You know, um, I'm not gonna go into details, but when you are spending probably sixty percent or seventy percent of your practice doing things that are never going to happen in the game of volleyball you're not very efficient at your practice. Right. And, and, and I, the culture also, like one of the things that a lot of people still do uh, is control. They like control of the, of the practice. They don't want to let the players have control. And, um, and, and that results into, um, you don't know, I know, you do what I say. And, and there is no guided discovery. There is no, let me lead you to the answer. Um, it's mainly explicit or implicit coaching. And it doesn't let the players think. And creativity is very important and you have to teach it at a young age. You have, the player have to have control and they have to learn how to make decisions. 
Right. So, so BJ, what was what what was kind of like the the big thing that you noticed like right away when you got over there? That good or bad? I don't, you know, either way. Sure. Um, uh, well, just <laughs> you know, the the funny part is is uh, the traffic. I mean, I, I was afraid to put my arm <laughs> out the window uh, because we we're, were so close to all the other cars in town. But um, on the volleyball side. Uh, as we started talking to people and and breaking down the you know the barriers of who are the new guys and where are they coming from, um, the thing that that by day two that I recognized is their culture is so rich in uh, respect and sharing and they they care so much and go out of the their way. Uh, individually to find out how you are, how your family is every single day. Um, I we had to we had to get to the facility about a half hour early so that we could greet and and chat with every single coach that walked in the door. Everybody, you know, hug and two kisses, and we're gonna find out how your family is and how are you feeling today, and did, are you know that, that's to me was incredible and and it's what I thought of every time they talked about we want to be you know we want to build to be like the United States and I kept saying no you don't your culture is perfect for growing this sport you need to do it your way and and use some of the things that maybe we we're gonna learn so so for me that was that was incredible I, I made some lifelong friends in a couple of days um, and uh, it's it's an incredible place to be. So I, I think um, that's that's probably the number one thing. But they're also like like we talked about, um, and and it's a habit here in the United States as well. We tend to copy. We tend to look at success, and we want to we want to do do it that way. So we may copy some things. Uh, if you happen to choose somebody that has a culture that fits yours, great. Uh, that, then you might see some success, and and that's kind of what Marwan's talking about with the French. Those two cultures don't work well together from a sporting standpoint. The, what the what the French are delivering and what the Moroccans are practicing are, I think, are two divergent ways of thinking, um, and, and it doesn't fit. So um, that's. That's maybe the the good and the bad <laughs> that yeah. that I. I don't know, Moran. Am I getting close to to no, your thoughts? No, it's good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's an incredible enthusiasm, though the 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 places we went and the uh, players and as soon as you string the ribbon and you make a bunch of little courts, they are there are a lot of competitors. Um, so I, I think it's like like volleyball everywhere. If you can get the ball flying, uh, you you get them hooked pretty quickly. Yeah, fair enough. Um, it, it, it's it is oh, definitely interesting traveling around and watching what is going on in other countries. And I mean, it, heck, even in this, there's a lot of variation uh, from region to region, gym to gym. Um, I had the the fortune; it was exhausting, but it was good of traveling around Europe uh, in uh, August and September. I think I was in what seven different countries, I think something like that. And some of the stuff I saw was great; other stuff was like, pull your hair out. I can't believe they're doing this. Like, just going out of your mind. Like, what is happening here? Sort of stuff. Uh, and you know, one of the things that you learn along the way is how to be politic and how to, how to be polite and, and how to address things without insulting people or, you know, getting them to shut down on you and things like that. Um, so what's, um, is there progress in the more experienced volleyball coaches in Morocco? You kind of already talked about the younger coaches. Are, are, you know, a lot of them are former players, so you know, they've already started <clears throat> seeing things differently. But is there are any inroads being made with the more experienced ones who are a little bit more entrenched? 
the short answer is no. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, um, I, I will tell you this, uh, John. When you go to practice, your number one uh, thing in your mind is I want to make my players better. Okay? Um, in order to get better, and we all know this in the U.S., you, do, you learn by doing. So when you look at practices and how, and I'm talking about the efficient or the more experienced coaches, <clears throat> and, and you, look, you go to attend their practice sessions, one, they talk a lot. So probably about 20 minutes of practice is wasted in talking. Two, they limit the amount of contacts per player, and they have more contacts than the players. So they, they love the coach-oriented practice. Mm. They don't like the players to have control of practice. So if you look at the two, a two-hour session, you might have the last 30 minutes of practice in a game-like situation, six versus six. And it's, and it's usually A team versus B team, which is not very good. Um, and um, and in within that 30 minutes, you might have an average of maybe, maybe if, if the players are lucky, like maybe 50 contacts per player in, 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 in 30 minutes that are game-like that you can say, okay, those 30 contacts can transfer to the game of volleyball during game day. So if you look at a week worth of practice, thinking that maybe they practice once a week, oh, I'm sorry, four times a week in a club, we know that each contact, the average with the body is 0 0.05 seconds. So 50 times 0 0.5 seconds times four is nothing mm -hmm. when it comes to game-like. When it comes to, I need to increase contacts per player per hour that has some transfer to the game. And that's what I'm talking about. Like that's where the efficiency doesn't happen in practice. That's when you don't simulate what will happen in the game in your practice. That's when you don't practice the out-of-system system. system. Um, they, they spend a lot of time practicing the 25%, maybe 84, 85 to 95% of the time in practice. And that's sad because you're teaching an overpass. You're teaching your pastors to overpass. You're teaching your servers to serve to an empty court. You're teaching the hitters to hit to an empty net. You're teaching the blockers to do like static blocking, um, things that will never happen in the game. Now, when you're talking, when you're going to an experienced coach in Morocco, here's what they're going to tell you, John. I am an FIVB level two coach. What are you talking about? And, and when you check, yeah, 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 yeah. And when you check, when was the last time they attended an, an FIVB clinic? It will probably be 15 years ago. So those experienced coaches, there is a, <clears throat> unfortunately, there is an education system by the FIVB that gives you a license that has no expiration date, which is dumb and stupid. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and you can go for as long as you are alive and tell people, I am an FIVB level three coach. I'm better than you. I, I, I'm sure you've experienced that in England. I would like to hear what you think about that. Um, yeah, actually, England, when I left anyway, because I, I did their level three, which is their top level, um, they, they've been proactive about trying to adapt their structure. But one of the things that I don't believe that they've done yet is put expirations like CAP does. So there's no four years you've got to recertify or take continuing credits or you know whatever you want to look at. Um, and they the way they set it up 
had, was based a lot on, and I'm forgetting the, the name of it, but there was kind of this like uniform uh, competency thing across all sports in the UK, where it's like, if you're a level one coach in any sport, this is what's going to be taught at that level one. And then same with level two. And it wasn't until you got level three that you were in the clear in your own sport and the rest mm. of the stuff fell away. The participants were completely dissatisfied with that structure. And so Volleyball England went away from it. I, I haven't been in it, so I don't, I don't know what it looks like now, but I've heard that the feedback is quite positive. But again, they do a good job within, this, within the structure of getting your certification of bringing in like additional professional development sort of things like going to certain clinics and stuff that are maybe multi-sport or whatever, but that's all just part of your, your post course requirements, mm. just like with, you know, cap three or anything like that. You got to do certain things with over there. It's like, okay, I had to do journal entries. I had to, I had to get evaluated on a coaching a session by a senior coach. And I had to take, I think, four or five of these other modules. Mm. Um, but like I said, they haven't they haven't gone with a, a just like a recertification process every every set number of years. FIVB is 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 an interesting thing because it's for those who don't know, essentially it's a fill in educational structure for coaches in places that are not well served locally. Correct. So nobody in the U.S. really knows anything about FIVB because we have CAP and we have ABCA and all that sort of stuff. Germany, yeah. likewise, they have their A licenses and B licenses and all that, so they don't worry about FIVB. It's it's other places outside of the you know kind of the top tier countries, um, you know, and as a result, it's probably not as well funded, not as well considered at times as it might be if it were more of a localized sort of phenomenon. Mm. Yeah. So, and and uh, uh, absolutely, um, it's more for developmental countries, like countries with lack of coaching education system and and lack of funding, and they just send a random instructor from somewhere in the world, and you know that's what you're learning that week. Yeah. You know, so it's it's very hard. No. Uh, do we have experienced coaches that have awesome potential? Yes. I know of a few. But we're going to um, – it's, it's that comfort zone that is mm. um, a little difficult to uh, maneuver because they, they have pride and they never want to be stuck not, know, not giving an answer to a player. Sure. Because they don't know. Right. <laughs> well, that's, a lot of coaches <laughs> yeah yeah that's uh, we're that way in the united states uh, <laughs> uh, look in the top 20 in the women's you know division one ncaa you know i bet there's a couple of coaches in there that that aren't uh, real willing to make changes either you know and and that's not to pick on them it could be the same at you know your local high school you might find uh you might find somebody that's unwilling to change and um, 30 miles away at the next high school, there's somebody that is willing to change. Um, yeah. That probably, you know, that's, that may be having more or less success. It's, you know, <laughs> yeah. Todd, Todd Maddox, who I'm going to have, uh, on a session next week described at one time as you've got the coach who coaches the same season 30 years in a row. Yeah. So yeah. they don't make any progress. They just do the same season over and over and over again and don't learn anything new, which I thought was was quite appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, Todd's great at, at coming up with that sort of style. I, the way the way uh, Kessel describes it is um, it's a lot of just chance. If, you're in a, if you happen to be in a place where, where you have um, a great coach or a coach that's that's paying attention to what works and what doesn't on a lot of different levels with the physical, the, the emotional, the psychological, all the, all the types of things that make a great player. Um, yeah, maybe you turn out to be a, a great player and a, and a great coach. Um, but if you're, if you go down a different pathway and you have, you just 
your pathway leads you to coaches that aren't paying attention to those things. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's chance and it's very unfortunate. That'd be the thing I'd give to volleyball if I could. Good coaches everywhere. Well, let me ask you both. Uh, what kind of pushback, if any, did, did John get when he was in Morocco doing, doing his thing? Um, it, you know, he is so well prepared and uh, such a good speaker. He, he doesn't, he's not a, a bully. I don't mean it to sound that way. I just, when he says something, he often doesn't just say it, he proves it, which is a great way for uh, a teacher to, uh, to work. And, and a lot of the ways that he used to, to prove things were by getting the audience to, to say them to him. You know, how did this work for you? How could we, how could this be better? Um, how could we teach you better? Uh, that was the theme of the whole two weeks. How could this be better? What could we make this, you know, how could we make this work? And he's just fantastic at it. It comes from experience. Uh, a lot of, a lot of videos, a lot of good examples. Um, uh, so I wouldn't say that there was a lot of pushback. I think there were places that we went for sure that, that people had questions and and uh you know we went we addressed eric and i addressed um pe teachers one day like marwan mentioned and a lot of them had the same question well these kids they don't hold their arms the right way or they're not setting the right way or it's not legal and and the argument that eric and i make is oh look they're playing and they're smiling and they're sweating and they're enjoying themselves we can worry about the other details later. <laughs> we want them to love the game, you know. So, so that I, I think having those proofs, uh, it kind of teaching through those proofs really helps helps that way. But a lot of questions, that's for sure. Well, I think I'm, I I wasn't there, John, so I don't know the pushback. I I heard some really positive feedback about the course from the people that I know that attended the course. However, I really want the one thing that they, that they need to know there is um, they need to change their rules. So they're not following locally, not internationally. When you are playing volleyball in Morocco, you need to make your own damn rules. And, um, we even have to think about it like an, an under 12, 12 and under. They play with the same rules, substitution rules, as in the FIVB Grand Prix. It's, it's, it's crazy. Six substitutions. So th there is very limited playing time, and it offers no love or no like desire for certain people to say it's only six people on this court and i'm sitting here cold all this time and i never see the court why do i want to play this sport and then you know in international volleyball once you come out you don't go back in yeah so you know the reason usa is successful in many ways is because they are not following FIVB rules when it comes to, you know, high school and club. Th that way you have more participation in, and more membership. If you limit the playing time, if you, if you put too much, res too much restrictions, they are not, you're not going to have more uh, people playing the sport. Therefore, your national team will suffer. Do they do any mini volleyball in Morocco, like they do in Europe? Nope. I, to the best of my knowledge, no. Maybe like, like privately, certain organizations will go to like schools and they will run, you know, programs and you know do you know balloons and all that kind of stuff and teach kids how to play and all that kind of stuff. But from the federation, no. Okay. Yeah. 
I mean, that's it's a it's a gripe for me here in the states as well. You know, and I, I we I was when I was at AVCA, there was a one of the sessions. Uh, there was an international couple of sessions. The, there was one that I was in where the topic of mini volleyball and and what you do with the younger age groups came up, and Doug Beal was was running it, and we all know John's been pushing mini volleyball for ever, you know, yeah. certainly as long as any of us can remember. Uh, and I asked Doug, I was like, Hey, you know, Castle's been talking about this for years. How come USA volleyball continues to sponsor 12 and under six V six for nationals and qualifiers and all that. And the, the response was essentially what I would consider a fear-based response is that, well, you know, some people think that it's only real volleyball, quote unquote, if you're playing six v six. So if we start playing four v four or three v three or whatever, then people are going to go to other federations. They're going to go to J. I appreciate that might be the case. Mm. I don't like that as an excuse. Uh, I, that's a fair based excuse. It's, it's, come on. Mm. If that's if that's going to happen, it's going to happen do what's right and yeah. in the long run you'll benefit educate people <laughs> yeah know? so it seems to work just fine in europe playing for you know 3v3 and 4v4 so we can do yeah. it here too here, here here are the facts um in in the united states in volleyball before 1984 there was no system in place Cuba won the world mm -hmm. the the Olympic Games. Let's follow what Cuba does. Uh, the Japan won the Olympic Games. Let's follow what Japan did. The Soviet Union did. Let's follow what they did, right? So after 1984, and after you know, uh, you know, meeting with Carl McGowan and putting like science into teaching and all that kind of stuff, you have more gold medals and you have a system in place. Um, and you have a pipeline of coaches that basically at the HP level teach the same thing. We don't have that in Morocco. Mm -hmm. You can go from the junior national team coach to the senior national team coach and transition off the net is completely taught differently. Right. So now you have a coach when a year later try teaching a player to do something completely different. There is no share of information. Um, there is no database training and, and certainly there was no coaching education. And that's why BJ and Eric and, um, and John went there and to kind of teach people, Hey, wait a second. We're not here to teach you to be like, give you systems for your pro team, but we're here to help you grow the game. You know, ways to like, how can we get more people to love the sport? Mm -hmm. You know, um, there are many countries in the world where maybe they don't use science in their coaching, but they have so many participants to choose from. They, they, they get lucky with talent. You know, um, and, and we don't have either in Morocco, so we work we want to be number one in Africa. We want to be going to the Olympic games. We want to participate in world championships. So it's, it's, it's very difficult. In 2015, John, when I went to Morocco, they hired an Italian coach. His name is Antonio Jacob. I don't know if you've heard of him before. Have you? Maybe. I'm okay. not sure. So, so uh, Antonio, uh, was the women's national team coach of Italy, I think, in the 70s. In 2004, he was the Tunisian national team coach, and he took them to Athens. Um, okay. Then he went to Egypt, won like Af two or three African Nations Cup World Championship. Uh, he qualified Tunisia to World Championship and the Olympic Games in 2004. In 2000, and then after that, he went for like six or eight years to Egypt. And then once he landed in Egypt, they won every year. Olympic game participation, uh, world championship, I think like three or four African Nations Cup titles. 
And then he left Egypt. And then in 2004, 15, uh, national Morocco hired him. And then I got a phone call from the Morocco national team, a technical director, and said, hey, would you, would you like to work with a uh, national team in the summer? Sure, no problem. So I went there. I don't, have, I don't know what to expect from Antonio. All I know is that this guy is from Europe. I don't know how he coaches. I don't know what his philosophy is. It might be that I'm going to be there for a week, or it might be that I'm going to be there the whole time. I don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. When I got there, I start a sentence, and he finishes it. He starts a sentence, and he finishes it. This guy was best friends, best friends, best buddies with Carl McGowan and John Kessel. To the point where if you look at, uh, if you ever look at uh, John's computer, he has a picture of Cody blocking in Italy. And that is in a coach's course organized by Antonio in Italy, where he invites Carl and John to come there every year. And this guy, USA Volleyball, 100%. Everything that the U.S. does, all motor learning, training, everything. I was shocked. It was amazing. Probably the best moment of my life. <laughs> and, um, and, and he, we worked there for African Nations Cup. We went to Italy. We scrimmaged the under-23 national team. And, uh, and then the under-23 national team was scrimmaged, which we beat when we were in Italy. Um, finished second in world championship. And then we went on to go to Cairo to participate in the African Nations Cup, which we took third place. We lost in a semifinal to Egypt. Um, after I came back to the U.S., back then I was at Penn, remember? Right. Yeah. I came back to work. Um, I had to go back by August 1st. And, um, and, and then he stayed in Morocco. Three, four months later, they let him go. Right? Listen. Now he is the head coach of Tunisia. <laughs> Since 2015, he won two Nations Cups. And now he in, in a, in a, in a quali he qualified to the Olympic Games in Tokyo. Why? Because he uses the science. The science in certain ways, was not appreciated in Morocco. And that's why John, Eric, and BJ went. Right. This, I gave you a story, did, but that's... Did you get any indication of... Yeah. Did, did they give you... Or have you heard any indication of why he got let go? I mean, was it... We, I mean, we don't believe in the way, his way of coaching, or... Something along those lines? I think the technical director of the national team really is like a pro USA volleyball science guy, like he's like back then. Um, I don't want to go into deep details, but um, uh, it, it was probably money related. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could see that. <laughs> yeah, so. That a so lot. It, yeah, it happens a lot, and that's 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 a big. Um, and and he wasn't to, to, to just tell you he wasn't expensive. Okay, gotcha. Uh, let me ask you this. Obviously, in any country, region, whatever, volleyball and in any sport is going to take on certain cultural elements relevant to to its its native culture. Um. Sometimes that can be expressed quite positively. Other times, maybe not quite as much. Um, it needs to be overcome. Are there elements of the Moroccan culture that can really be worked into Moroccan volleyball to, to help it move forward? Um, why don't you take this question, Peter, first? <laughs> For answer, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, it, I mentioned a little bit of this before. They, the, the coaches, the people that we met, um, very fast friends everywhere. 
they want to share. I think you have to be, I think you have to be convincing. And there is certainly the challenge of overcoming tradition. We have, we have that everywhere. Um, I think if you can, if you can be a little bit convincing, the, the culture there is, is ripe for success. These are, I found people to work hard and to enjoy uh, playing. Uh, they were smiling and laughing and sweating and everything that you want out of people. Um, and, and just in that culture, I think they're, I think they're ahead of where the U.S. is for sure. We have a lot more people that are playing, but I think they were they were just more more apt to uh, to give and to share than some of the places I see where I have success. So I'm going to close the doors and you know keep keep people out because I don't want people to learn my secrets or whatever. So I think that's the biggest thing. And then as Marwan said. Um, probably um i i think there are some good systems in place just not being utilized in volleyball as well they're they're the the athletes are getting sorted out so i think if they could follow the model of what they're doing with basketball and handball i I think those types of things um you know getting the getting players playing and enjoying it i think those I, i think everything is there for them to be successful yeah, I think, I think in within the nature of the culture, people are curious, and and they want to learn, um, and there is a huge desire of learning. I, I, I every Saturday night we do a Zoom um, meeting where we talk about a topic with Moroccan coaches, and we have fifty to sixty people attending every time. Um, So absolutely, there is curiosity is there. People want to learn. Now, uh, can we implement the science into what we do with the players? That's the big question. Um, uh, I I don't think it has to do with the culture. I think it has to do with the education system we have in Morocco. Um, We, we, um, you know, the the French is dominated. I mean, I, I we just which which is like amazing to me, John. I, I um US is number one in basketball. US is number one or two in volleyball. US is number one or two in women's soccer. Uh, you, you know, you, you look at a lot of sports in the Olympic uh like Olympic sports in the in USA and they are top three in the world. Why would you follow the French? Why would you even like, 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 why would you go and say, I want to pass to the wall? I don't understand. It makes me crazy. And, and, and um, once we establish education for coaches based on facts and science, I think we can be number one. But until then, we're going to remain in number three or number four. Gotcha. All right. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, I, as I said before, feel free to, to shoot them in. Um, any other elements to the experience, BJ, that, that we haven't really touched on yet? Um, I, I think uh, for, for, for me personally, uh, a, a different way of looking at Africa and certainly um, – you know, it's, uh, uh, I learned a lot about Morocco, um, and, uh, you know, and John, you probably know this, you know this better than I do, before you really make up your mind about a place, or before you can, can decide what a place is like, you've got to visit it. You've got to go and, and meet the people, and spend some time there, and, uh, and really understand what daily life is like, um, that was, you know, that was the first thing that was very obvious to me. Um, just the, the warmth of the culture, incredible, that, that part of it, um, they're, they're, uh, they care on a much more, on a much deeper level. 
about everybody. Um, and I'll go back to the traffic example. We're in six lanes of traffic in a, in a roundabout that has no traffic signs and there are carts and cars and buses and trucks and bicycles and pedestrians. And somehow there's, there's no road rage. There's no finger coming out the window that everybody is happy to yield and it, it all works somehow. I mean, they really care about their, their uh, fellow pedestrians or fellow travelers getting to where they need to go. And uh, that, uh, that in and of itself was, was a learning experience for me. I, I was, you know, it really does show the, the, the culture that, that was, um, that's probably the thing that's been most impressive to me uh, about, about going there. Um, you know, <laughs> it's how you, you know, can you, can you tell a society by its traffic? I don't know. I don't know. If that's the best way. <laughs> it really comes out in the way they just deal with each other. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'm with you in terms of you, you kind of have to, it's not, it's not enough to go to a place as a, as a tourist because when you're a tourist, you get caught up in things that aren't really the local culture per se. You're not, you're not necessarily experiencing life like somebody who actually lives there because you're so focused on going to the things that all the other tourists are going to. But if you can spend time in a place, use public transportation, walk around, be on the street, go to the shops, have to try to make yourself understood in a language that's probably not yours, or and maybe at best you know a few words here and there. It, it's a completely different experience than just going and, you know, go to Paris and see the Eiffel Tower and, and stuff like that. Uh, and it's, it's much more educational and rewarding to my mind. I, mean, I don't know. People might disagree. Um, did you get a question coming in? Uh, BJ, based on your short experience in Morocco, what are the first three things you will change to help them be better coaches? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, the, the number one thing would be to um, – to adjust the, the rules for younger players, build the grassroots system by playing um, with a lighter ball and smaller courts and, and, and um, get younger people to enjoy playing. And, and that, that's, that's one and one A is adjust the equipment and two, play and get away from the boring you know, bouncing it off the wall or coach hammering it at me. Um, I think those, those two things alone would have a groundswell. And then the third thing I think is, uh, is some combination of building a, a coaching um, community. I, I don't want to just say education. I think it's more than that. I think it's getting the coaches to know each other and to, to travel, to play each other and to share ideas. And, and in that lies the education as well. Um, if, if they could build a, I wouldn't say a club system like here, <laughs> you know, there, there are plenty of things that aren't perfect about our club system, but if they could, <laughs> you know, utilize their, uh, they, there are, there are basketball clubs and soccer clubs and volleyball clubs. And it, I think the volleyball clubs are maybe a little bit behind, but if they could use some of that, those would be the things that I would, that I would get going. Uh, Marwan, did you, what, what would your no, couple? Be? I agree. Huh. To we're me, little, I just want to grow the game. <laughs> Marwan and I are too similar. <laughs> Nice and easy. <laughs> um, I mean, to that point, the one of the things that I've been talking with people in the last maybe year, maybe a little bit longer, is about developing a global coaches association of some kind, basically to help 
you know, with, with, with the coaches who don't have the advantage of something like ABCA. Because in a lot of places, um, yes, you may have the federation that does something in, in coaching education. But again, the federation has its own priorities that may be separate from, yeah. from what coaches need to do. Uh, so there's, there's value of having something that, that coaches can, can be part of. And obviously part of it's an educational sort of thing, but inherently I would want the structure to include regionalized or country groups exactly for what you're talking about so that Moroccan coaches or North African coaches or whoever it is in whatever part of the world can connect with each other to talk about and address things that are specific to them while also having access to the larger resources of a global community to help, you know, best practices and, hey, you guys tried that, had that work in your part of the world, maybe we can adapt that to use here sort of thing. So with any luck, we'll get that moving forward at some point. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question for Marwan now. Wants to know, what was your coaching style when you started coaching? Oh, horrible. <laughs> very bad. Um, I was very mean. Um, I thought the players were very dumb. Um, I was very impatient. And I, um, I coached the way I was coached. So, um, pass to the wall, coaches, coach oriented practice. You're not allowed to make mistakes. Um, you know, um, coaching with fear. Um, you know, picking up water bottles and smashes, like, you know, um, destroying them during, t you know, the game. You know, I was not a very good example. Um, and then the transformation happened um, and when I started learning about, yes, I played the sport. Yes, I played for the national team of my country. And yes, I hit the ball in the one foot line once before. Um, yes, I did all of that, but are my players having fun? Are they enjoying the sport? Is it about me or is it about them? Um, and then when I realized it wasn't, it wasn't about me, I was like, all right, well, I really need to get some coaching education. So, um, the very first course, of course I took impact and then, um, cap one. And then I, um, and then I went and took FIVB level one and then I took FIVB level two in a totally different part of the world. I went all the way to, uh, Qatar and met, you know, took the course there with different coaches, different style, you know, kind of like, you know, Asian flavor to it. Um, and then, of course, Catherine became a cadre. And I was very fortunate to meet a lot of people in my life that uh, helped me be a better coach. And I'm still uh, learning and hopefully continue growing. But um, the old Marwan was, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to be my friend. <laughs> well, following up on that, how long did it take for you to, to realize that the original Mar one was not the best Mar one? Probably about four years. You, you know, John, when I started coaching, I used to go to warm up in, with my club team, and I used to put on a show for people in warm up, thinking that look at me, I'm that good. I used to do that. And now that I'm, when I think about that, or when I see someone at a club tournament do that, I laugh. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I can't believe I was that dumb. I was that stupid. I, 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 don't, I, I wasn't the one to be, you know, competing after that warm up. After the warm up, I would, go, I would be sitting on the bench and not allowed to touch the ball. But yet, I was the one that's, touching most of the balls at warm up. And just that was like my ego, um, you know, how, how great I wanted to look. Um, look how my, my arm swing is amazing. 
and it was it was dumb and stupid and you know I, I can't believe I did that and and it took me about three years my the, the, I'll tell you this with my club team we were we were uh, particip- we're going to participate in rally at a tournament Maple Rally Mid Atlantic Power League. And every year, the, that tournament, amazing tournament, mm-hmm. they would uh, host a sitting volleyball uh, match between USA and Netherlands or USA and another team. They would invite a team from overseas. And that, my, my light bulb moment was that year, John Castle was there with the sitting national team and he did the coaches clinic before the tournament. So I drove down to Raleigh to what to listen to him and then that was like the moment i was like shit i am really sucky coach so um and i made it my um i made it my goal to never stop learning all right bj did you answer that question that came in I did. Friday, <laughs> okay. Friday cookies, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, any any last points you'd want to leave us with, Marwan? Um, I thank you a lot for uh, hosting this uh, meeting for you and I and BJ. I really hope uh, that we can, you know, do this more often, share more information and experience. Um, and uh, hopefully we, you know, BJ and Eric and uh, John made impact on coaches over in Morocco. And, you know, if we get better by one, two, three percent, that's two, three percent better than before they went there. And, and that's very important. All right. Very good. Anything from you, BJ? No, I just, um, I, it was a uh, trip of a lifetime. I, I appreciate it so much, um, Marwan, you know, trusting me and and Eric uh, to to go over and to, to learn with and hopefully do a little bit of teaching as well, some of, uh, some of his friends. And, um, I, you know, I came back, uh, changed. I started studying Arabic and learning little bits and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really um, become uh, an important, uh, you know, important uh, part of my coaching experience is to think about things going on over there. Much appreciated. All right. Well, thanks you guys for, for the time. Thanks for everybody Thank for turning time. up and for the questions to come in. These sessions have been awesome. Incredible what you're doing here. Thank appreciate you, John. it. Glad to hear it. it.